It's about 12.30 on a Tuesday and I'm Leanne Gerrans, a reporter and a producer for Bloomberg and I just had to nip out of the office to do some errands this afternoon and as I left the In The City podcast team asked me to grab a mic and just get a feel for what's happening on the streets around our building and what shops are closed and open and what people are grabbing. I've just walked past Oasis, one of my old clothing stores I used to come to regularly, but sadly, it's now closed. There's a few people that I can see just shopping in Argos there, probably getting some more essentials. I need to pick up some coat hangers at some point. So I'm just outside Paper Taste, which is a shop that sells everything from cards to sparkly pens to fancy photo frames. So there's a big yellow sign saying all stock reduced. And when we peek through the window, it says 20% off pretty much everything. So I've just walked into Paper Chase. I'm having a look around. Oh my gosh, Peter Rabbit birthday invitations. And it's 70% off. £1.50. So I'm carrying on walking down Poultry Street. I need to go and get a gym top actually. So I've just entered One New Change, the shopping centre near our office. Well, Hugo Boss is empty and then Nespresso, pretty much empty. I'm just in a very popular athletic shop here in the city and I was looking for a top to play my tennis match in. Trying to find a top in a different size, so I'm just gonna have to ask the lady. So ironically, I just had to leave Sweaty Betty because I couldn't stand in the queue any longer waiting to get another size top. And that's because it was just too busy. So maybe some stores are weathering the storm. So Dave and Francine, I hope you've enjoyed my on the ground reporting and got something out of it because I didn't. I'm David Merritt. And I'm Francine Lacqua. And this is In the City, Bloomberg's podcast connecting you to the stories and the voices at the heart of the City of London. Now this week we talk shopping and distress. It's not an easy time, is it, Francine, on the British High Street? I mean, you walk around here outside, there are empty shops. They've been empty since the pandemic, but no one's taking the space. It's not just here, it's all over London. Yeah, I don't know how many people actually come to the City of London to shop, but it is a I guess a good barometer on whether people also come back to the office. So I wonder whether this is distressed companies and distressed retailers or whether we shop differently. Selfridges have got that huge neon sign outside saying, what does it say? We've got to reinvent how, you know, change the way we shop. And yeah, there's a lot of footfall down Oxford Street, but there's still those empty stores, those big flagship uh, buildings like Debenhams, like House of Fraser, that no one wants to take over. And it's all about the economy with, of course, the cost of living crisis, higher interest rates, the highest since 2007, and inflation hitting a lot of consumers that maybe would have, you know, not thought twice about buying two or three coats. Exactly. And it just feels like it's possibly worse here than anywhere in the world. We know the economic headwinds are everywhere, but, you know, we've had the report about the British economy faring worse than all the G7 this year. And companies are in distress. We've got a new newsletter out. That's exciting. This is a new Bloomberg newsletter, which everyone needs to subscribe to. The Brink. The Brink. And it's called that because this is what companies are facing, right? There's a big debt cliff that everyone's looking at. And who's going to be the next company, the big you know, high street name to fail. That's what everyone's talking about. The Brink, it kind of fills me with dread. So to unpack all of this, we're joined in the podcast studio by our UK retail reporter, Katie Linzel, and Julia Morporgo, European credit and high yield and distressed reporter. So thank you both for joining us. So Katie, how bad is it? Well, it depends which part of retail you look at, but it's not looking very comfortable, let's put it that way. So many retailers are hoping that over the course of this year, things will get better. You know, inflation will start to ease off a bit. But really, we're seeing it's it's pretty tough. And for example, if you look at the online only fast fashion retailers, they had some a very bumpy performance over Christmas. Of course, they were also faced by postal strikes. So that made it much harder to get items out to customers. ASOS, for example, if we take 
them as an example, they are looking at a loss for the first half and promising a lot in their second half performance. And they have debt coming due next year. So uh, yeah, there are many names we can look at that it's it's a bit painful at the moment. I I mean, we spoke before Christmas, didn't we, about what the outlook might be. And the numbers are are kind of in now. Is it across the board? Has it been a bad season for the retailers in Britain? So volumes did actually fall at Christmas. It was only a minor fall, but still that's something that a lot of people are looking at because when you look at the sales figures, a lot of retailers were coming through and saying sales have grown. Um, The supermarkets in many cases were saying we had record sales in the approach to Christmas. But this is inflation that's pumping up sales figures. You know, we're paying more for, for getting less at the moment. So yeah, I think it is looking very tough. And Christmas was a bit better than than many observers expected. But at the same time, we've seen a lot of consumers leaning on debt. They're using buy now, pay later to make some of those purchases. It's not the most comfortable position to be in going into 2023. Um, Julia, how is this translating into the health of these companies? Are we seeing, uh, you know, ag- you know, heightened levels of distress when we look at the debt that a lot of these companies have got? If your demand, demand from your consumers is lower and if your costs are going up, because we have to think about these retailers like Apple stores, supermarkets, they're leaning also with things like higher staff costs, higher energy bills. So you've got like a combination that leads to them generating fewer profits and fewer cash to just pay interest on their debt. And that's particularly an issue when companies have a heavy debt structure, which is what a lot of these retailers, especially in the UK, have built over the last years. You know, supermarkets that are loaded up with billions and billions of debt. Like as soon as you start generating a bit less cash, it becomes a problem to keep servicing these heavy debt structures. But Julia, what are they focusing on? So is it, are are they just trying to preserve market share at the moment? Or are we finding ourselves that because of the leverage in the past and interest rates going higher, there's just retailers that are going to go bust because they can't afford it? I think the focus is on, you know, just staying afloat in terms of operations and retaining the market share they have. But also on the debt side is really trying to lower the debt structure if they can. A lot of them are doing asset sales, for instance. It's not exactly a retailer, but one company that comes to mind is Stonegate Pub. Bloomberg reported that they're selling over a thousand uh, pubs. The thing that they're trying to do mostly is really trying to refinance their debt if maturities are approaching, but that's increasingly challenging and increasingly costly. And as a debt investor, you want to be selective when it comes to which credit you're going to be investing in. So you look at the retail sector and think, oh, well, maybe this is not for me. I'm going to go with something that's less consumer exposed because we are in a high inflation a recessionary environment. So a lot of them are not able to access capital markets like they used to be. And therefore, the they have to seek emergency funding. And that's um, and if they find it, because if they don't find it, it's probably going to head for insolvency. We've seen many of them unable to meet their maturities and having to start talks with creditors. One example is Matalan, the discount retailer. They just got taken over by funds because they were not able to refinance their bonds that were due in January and they were not able to sell the company because no one was offering enough for it. Sounds like a pretty bleak bleak situation. You know, people are not able to refinance this debt. You mentioned the word recession. You know, we're in a recessionary environment, you said. I mean, historically, a recession means disaster for the high street, right, for retailers. Is that what many of them are experiencing now, Katie? Is, are we are we deep in recession in Britain? Well, we've seen plenty of insolvencies lately, right? I think it was this week that Paper Chase came to light. And, yes, you know, but one is boarded up. One, well, not right, boarded right up. Nearby, yeah, but it's got the closing down signs. Yeah. yeah, so Tesco has stepped in to buy Paper Chase, but that means the brand, that means the IP, that does not mean the stores or the employees. And how many stores um, is that? That's... Well, it's hundreds, it's, right? it's many, yeah, yeah. it's hundreds. Um, and um, also late last year, we saw Jules go into insolvency, Made.com. You know, both of those were bought by Next. But again, this is not the case of stores being kept or loads of jobs being kept. Um, so there are some opportunities for the for the big retailers who are playing the game correctly. Um, Next and also Fraser's, Mike Ashley's Empire, they're doing quite a lot of buying. Um But, you know, in the UK in recent years, we've seen quite a few retailers go under. And I think we're in that pattern. You know, it's it's not disappeared. Um, The retailers have really struggled to survive during the pandemic. And now we've got cost of living. It's a pretty painful double whammy. I mean, no retailer is created equal. So is it is it the bad retailers? Like, is it the retails where people don't shop that go bust? Or could it be a healthy retailer 
that just can't get up front of, you know, some of the financing that they need to deal with? I think it's definitely uh, the healthy ones uh, and with a healthy capital structure are going to be able to weather the storm. It's more a matter of really how levered your capital structure is and uh, what's really your appeal to consumers in this time, you know? Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, mid-range uh, retailers being squeezed, for instance, and those are probably, you know, if combined with a lot of debt, are going to be the ones that struggle the most. In the grocer space, the names that everyone is looking at are Asda and Morrisons, which are kind of in the mid-range when it comes to which uh, uh, consumer base they target. They are losing clients to supermarkets like Aldi and Lidl uh, because people are trying to shop a bit cheaper. And both as the Morrisons have billions of debt that were loaded on them as they were the um, object of leverage buyouts at a time when valuations were so high. Now it looks like their um, value and the market share that they have is going down and they have these, you know, billions of debt that they need to service. So uh, investors are particularly concerned about those type of names in the middle, I would say. So all of those deals that were done, so leveraging up these companies that happened for years and years with very low interest rates, obviously the Bank of England put up rates to 4%. There's possibly more to come uh, until those have peaked. Who's feeling the pain from all of this? You know, which investors are really hurting? What is going to be the fallout from uh, these deals not being able to be refinanced? I mean, definitely, if you are a, a junk debt investor that has piled money into these deals, you are worried about seeing the bond prices moving down and you're worried about uh, not being uh, able to refinance. On the other hand, if you are a distressed investor and you're looking at these uh, bond prices going down and you're thinking, OK, this company is not going to be able to um, access capital markets, it might be an opportunity for them. They might step in, buy the debt, and if a solution is not found, kick off negotiations with the company and eventually take it over for a very cheap price. So there's opportunities here for people investors there are with definitely the right opportunities. appetite. Exactly. Well, you need to be able to digest a lot of risk, I guess. How's I mean, how's luxury doing? It's been a, a huge growth sector but i mean they need the chinese <laughs> yeah lux lux luxury won't want Brandy's the chinese back. Propping it up personally. but uh, how is how is the luxury sector Lewis doing in girl. britain and also you know across europe luxury is broadly doing much better i mean we should be looking at sort of the luxury and the budget end of retail as being the, the sort of strong performers so either either pole basically yes. sort of very cheap or luxury yes and so people you know they're still buying their luxury handbags i mean that there are, we should remember there are those who aren't so touched by the cost of living crisis right and they can keep buying um but yeah generally the picture with luxury in the uk is that we want the chinese visitors back and uh, we want the sort of VAT they're coming, shopping right? they're coming. yes but i think that's not until a bit later in the year i think it's a bit early to say that right now um, but yeah, I was speaking to Harrods recently, for example, and they are very much looking forward to this later in the year. So Kitty, who's the squeeze middle? Like, where's John Lewis? John Lewis, I mean, they're in a bit of a rocky position, right, as a department store with still still so many stores across the UK. Um, and I mean, they didn't, they didn't actually have to report on their Christmas performance. So we'll wait and see. Um, John Lewis do sort of lean heavily on the fact that they there's this word that comes up in retail, which I don't really love, but omni-channel. So this idea that the retailer can reach you at home, in store. Um, of course, they have a tie-up with Waitrose for their deliveries and returns and things. So, um, so yeah, John Lewis, I think the, the jury is out. We will see how that goes. Can I do a poll? Yeah. When's the last time you were in store, Dave? You know what? I went into John Lewis the other day, but actually only to... Did return a broken product that oh, I put online. Okay, Returns. when's the last time you were in store, Katie? To purchase or just browsing? Purchase. Brow oh, oh, oh. Um, I don't even know. I bought online the you other week. Does that actually, count? I, I, mean, a, actually, I, I buy a book this week. I probably everything doors. on Amazon. Where'd, last time? I think like two, three weeks ago. Okay, so yeah. you're like the outlier, but the, you know, things yeah. are changing. We just yeah. don't go to stores really anymore. And this is the time of year as well. You know, January, February, it's all the post-Christmas gloom. You know, why, why would we be visiting stores as much as we did during that, that run up to Christmas? So it's, it's a tough time. I, I think Dave went to <laughs> Talks for Street and was shocked. He's never hey, doing well, Talks for Street. Exactly Certainly not for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> too, too many people for but you. A lot of people, but no, you know, but were they actually buying anything? It's a question, right? People are swarming to these areas, but I don't know if... Yeah. They're actually transacting, I think. Yeah, I mean, retail is still a very popular sort of leisure activity, right? So um, we've since the pandemic, we've seen online come back, as, as we were discussing. You know, it, it hasn't been the boom that, that people were hoping. So there is more footfall to stores, but how much purchasing is happening is, is yet to be seen. 
Um, Julia, how are we stacking up in Britain versus the rest of the world? I mean, we've heard about the RMF saying Britain's going to be the only G7 country that's going to contract this year. Are we in a work? You know, we love talking ourselves down in Britain, don't we? Are we worse in terms of the debt situation, in terms of the forecast for these retailers than ever us? Well, I have to say that it's not looking exactly good, like especially when compared to the rest of Europe. The British high street is extremely, extremely leveraged because it's a bigger sector and it's been the subject of a lot more leverage buyout. Uh, private equity firms have been targeting British retailers uh, um, for a long time and uh, it's just not been the same level of transactions when it comes to re- the other um, European markets. But that means that they're more leveraged and therefore when you start having less, generating less cash, but you have these heavier debt structures and I mean, that's going to be more of an issue in the UK than anywhere else in Europe. The other thing is that inflation has obviously hit the UK the hardest, especially versus uh, the Eurozone, for instance. So, uh, yes, it's not looking exactly good, but the US is in a similar situation as well. In the US, we've seen a lot of big retailers um, nearing the brink of uh, bankruptcy. I mean, Bed Bath & Beyond, we're expecting it to file within days. So that's... Oh, I went into a Bed Bath & Beyond. Did you? The day. Yeah. There you go. It was enormous on 6th Avenue and that was the only person in there. What were you looking for? I, w- I was looking for a mop. <laughs> it was a long story. Okay, you're killing yes. the dream, Dave Merritt. You are killing the dream. I didn't find the one, dream. by the way. Uh, so then I walked out in a huff and ordered one on Amazon. There we go. There you go. That's, that's, disclaimer. That's, that's, disclaimer. Um, Katie, I guess the, you know, as long as the labor market holds tight, so people will consume less, but the labor market is so tight yes. in the UK because they can't find the staff that you could see maybe more of a pickup in consumer spending quicker than we think. Yes. And the key thing is, you know, jobs numbers, people keeping their jobs. Um, so, yeah, I think, for example, whenever you talk to Next, Simon Wolfson at Next, it, this, these are the things he's looking at. And if we can keep employment high in the UK, then we can keep people spending to some extent. Um, and this year is going to be an interesting one because it should be one of transformation, right? That's what we're hearing from the inflation figures. Uh, but later in the year, we should really see purchases pick up again. So so we'll see what happens. But Bath and Beyond, I mean, do we have any companies like this that could go under? I feel like the Brits are very much into their DIY and bathrooms. Yeah, I think in the UK, what really, like, I mean, the size and scope of Bed Bath & Beyond, like probably the, the thing that comes the closest is the supermarkets. And that's what investors and the people in the um, credit community are really keeping their eye on at the moment. So we'll see how they weather the storm. And when you look at the debt pricing and, and what's happening in the in the markets here, where are the warning signals? Is it is it's around the super? Are some of those bonds trading at really alarming levels now? They are, they are. I mean, uh, especially when it comes to the UK, we've really hit the lows in uh, September, uh, October, uh, around the time when the, the market crisis stem from the mini budget uh, really affected the British markets. But now they've recovered a little bit, but the ones that people are worried about are still trading at deeply distressed levels. I feel like everyone, like everyone I know and their mother and their cousin and their second cousin removed has been to the power, Battersea Power Station. So are we shopping, are we expecting now an experience? So it's, if not shopping malls somewhere where you go and eat and maybe browse instead of you go to a shop with a purpose. Yeah, it's all about experience now. So we, as we've been discussing, you know, we've seen so many retailers board it up. And uh, what retailers really want to have is some fantastic restaurants and bars and cafes right next to their store. Um, We're also seeing, for example, retailers bring services and experiences into store. So, for example, Gymshark, the fitness brand, um, opened up their new store on Regent Street not that long ago. And they have, I think it's called the Sweat Room, actually, which is quite sort of visual, but um, (laughs) they offer fitness classes inside the store. Um, And this is really to sort of promote the brand. You know, what my daughter did last weekend, she had a a birthday party at Westfield, not to shop, but to do roller, uh, roller booting with the kind of, you know, with sort of house music. And they get them all in there and there's and it's packed. Yeah. It's sold out for weeks, this place. And then when you're there, you might then go into Zara or you might do something else. But that is the reason. To, that's the only reason to yeah. go to Westfield. Now. Or go to the cinema or go yep. check out the restaurants. Yeah, it's it's got to be an experience with all of these these items on offer, really. And so how does that change the shopping centers? Actually, I mean, how does it change? Are we going to see more shopping centers and empty high streets? Well, hopefully those sites that are vacated by the retailers will be taken by the likes of 
restaurants and bars. And for example, Julia, I think you were mentioning McLaren as well. You know, we're seeing all these brands we wouldn't expect to see on our high street, at Range Rover, Land Rover, whoever it might be. Uh, Tesla, I think, have, have a store in Brent Cross. So, you know, it's this idea of trying to get shoppers in to check out the, the cars, maybe also have an experience. You're not, if you're buying a Tesla, you're not going to go to Brent Cross to buy it, are you? Or maybe you People are. People go to Brent Cross to buy Teslas. They do. Yeah. Breaking oh. news. Why, why would you not go to Brent Cross to buy a Tesla? Being, I don't want to be mean about Brent Cross. It's just <laughs> well, You want the experience. You, <laughs> you want really the latte to go with it. How does the year, how does the year look? Do you, I mean, you know, the Doom forecast is we get some big names going bust again. I mean, what's your sense talking to people in the market, talking to the people trading the bonds and thinking about the refinancing of these companies? You know, the Bank of England talked about maybe things are going to be a little bit rosier this year than they said last year. What's your What's your sense? I definitely think it's going to be a matter of the healthiest firms are going to survive while the uh, weaker one are definitely going to have to face, uh, are going to face issues. Uh, I think if you're a debt investor and you have all these like British names and they're very retail and consumer oriented focused because that's how the composition of the uh, British um, junk rated the debt market is, you're going to want to pick the healthiest ones, the ones that have uh, lower amounts of debt, the ones that have uh, just better cash generation. And so you can pick and choose. And the ones that you're not going to choose, the ones that are not appealing are definitely going to have to face um, a wake up call. And this did not happen in the pandemic because despite the shops were being were closed for so long, it was really easy to access emergency liquidity. You had the government supporting you. You could access, you know, 500 million of new bonds at 3% interest rate. Now, this is definitely not a possibility anymore. Uh, one of the things that we should also sort of take into account when it comes to retail and the environment at the moment is that it's a big opportunity for these alternative lenders. So when retailers can't turn to their banks, you know, we're seeing these guys like Bantry Bay, backed by Elliott and Hilco, you know, they've recently come in and been lending. Bantry was to Superdry and um, Hilco was to Wilco, which is a nice little rhyme. And um, yeah, it's an opportunity for them, right, to come in where the banks won't go. And, and private equity. I mean, I always feel like if you look at the, the you know famous brands that we all know on the high street, at some point, they've been owned by private equity, if not now. Yeah, it's definitely a theme that we're seeing. I mean, last year it was really difficult to access financing for buyouts, but now credit markets are looking a little bit healthier um, for strong sponsors that are looking to buy debt. So we're expecting private equity firms to turn their attention to UK retailers again because uh, they can really buy them at cheaper prices now. So opportunity. There's opportunity there. in distress. There is. You just have to, you know, as I said before, like get ready for uh, digesting a lot of risk and uh, pick and choose really which ones you believe can have a healthier outlook. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's In the City. We will be back next week. But in the meantime, if you like our show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and rate, review and subscribe. This episode was hosted by me, David Merritt. And me, Francine Lacqua. It was produced by Summer Sardi. Additional editing by Blake Maples. And special thanks to Julia Mulpergo and Katie Linsell. Find more stories like this one featured in our The Brink newsletter, chronicling corporate distress and turnaround stories. Sign up at blimbo.com slash newsletters or via the show notes. We have to say it a bit more dramatically. The Brink! <laughs>